Hello, Story Seekers. I'm Nico. I'm Ben, and you're listening to The Tiny Bookcase. Our guest for this episode is an author of sci-fi and horror. He's the author of the cyber-noir novel Complete Darkness, and his short stories feature in the anthology volumes of Neo-Cyberpunk and Dread Cold. He's also the co-creator of the Hosts in the Shell Cyberpunk Discussion Podcast. We'd like to warmly welcome Matt Adcock. Hello, hey. Matt. Good evening. And we've been told, we've been briefed firmly to say Adcock. Indeed, yeah. Don't try and fudge it. Don't try and fudge it. Fantastic. Don't go fudging this man's cock. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, No, it's lovely to have you on, man. Um, Especially because you're a fellow podcaster. Fascinating. Uh, I think we've had had a couple couple on before, but that you write um, uh, short stories, novels, and have a podcast, it's goals for us. So cool. I mean, I don't know what you guys have published, but like um, in terms of a podcast, you are aspirational for us. Oh, wow. very much kind of uh, noobs and um, we're still learning as we go but some of the feedback we've had is that people quite like the crapness so we've intentionally left some <laughs> of it in there you know um, well whenever we do that it's accidental so at least you're deliberately trying to do it <laughs> and no one tells us they like our crapness <laughs> oh no um, yeah so, so you want to tell us about hosting the show then it's you do you take like okay. particular bits of cyberpunk and then discuss it or yeah, that's exactly what we do. Um, oh, it's eclectic in that you know we've we've we do everything from written media, films, TV series, games. Um, there's cyberpunk has become such a wide phenomena, um, and yeah. going back to its inception, sort of back with the daddy of kind of William Gibson and stuff back in the day, it's um it's not going anywhere. It seems to have resurgence after resurgence, uh, thanks to things like the Matrix and now just recently the the big twenty seven seven game. It's um it's always there, and Netflix in keen on it. You know, you've got the peripheral, we've got Edge Runners, both currently uh, streaming. Carbon as well, that sort of count, or is that a bit too? Carbon is definitely, yeah, we've done, yeah. A, done a, an episode on that. That's the most expensive Netflix series ever made. So um, is it really? Crikey. Yeah, to date. I mean, I'm probably working on something else. <laughs> yeah, I would have yeah. thought so. So you do that with uh, John Richter as well, don't you? Uh, who's also... not his real name. Yeah, right. John Richter is the character from Total Recall, of course. Oh, um, right. That's fun. The original, not the remake. Um, sure. And uh, yeah, his real name is David Derbyshire, but um, he'll, probably, <laughs> he'll probably kill me for saying that because he just basically writes under John Wick because it sounds sexier. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel like the double D is a is a good way to go as well. But, <laughs> um, Depends on your audience. Potentially, yeah. yeah. So just so people know where to find this, if you, you go on uh, Twitter, you can find them at Hosts in the Shell, and they yeah. also uh, go through Buzzsprout and everything like we do. So I'm assuming that goes absolutely everywhere. Spotify, yeah, 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 the whole lot, uh, even Amazon and stuff, you know. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Um, and you're in writing, so you have written uh, one novel so far, but you've got another coming out soon. Oh, yes. Um, I have my first novel, Complete Darkness, is a strange tale where we map hell by mistake in the near future. Oh, and very, very bad things happen. Um, it's we're basically exploring dark matter, and the uh, the devil is the president. I mean, you know, make of that what you will. Uh, but the hero is uh, an unlikely hero. He's kind of a Han Solo, sort of Bruce Willis-y kind of um, you know, kindred loner spirit. And um, he accidentally gets given superpowers by the devil. Uh, and uh, so by the end, they fight, you know, not to give it all away, but you know, that's the kind of <laughs> art story arc. Um, and this, did you also convert it into a comic as well? Yeah, oh my God, this is the best thing in my life. Uh, no oh. offence to my family, but... Um, <laughs> um, during lockdown, an artist got in touch and said, look, I've read your novel. It's great. It'd make a great comic. And I was like, damn, yeah, it really would. But I can't draw or have any artistic ability. She said, look, you can write. So you script it and I'll draw it. And fortunately, this Carl Brown, who's Northern Irish, he um, he has a 2000 AD kind of Judge Dredd-esque sort of style, which I really liked. Yeah. So it would have been really awkward if he'd said, I'll draw it. And I'd said, yes. And then it'd come back and been crap. And I'd be like, oh, oh, go dear. <laughs> but no, absolutely love it. So um, yeah, we did a Kickstarter. We got about three grand for issue one, and we're just about wow. to kickstart issue two because um, it's taken about a year between issues uh, to kind of amazing. Get all, yeah, that is very exciting. I can see why. I can see why you you like you know you're excited about it because it sounds bonkers cool. 
it's just so much fun. You know, I never, I mean, A, I didn't dream I'd get published, but, you know, without um, having to pay to get published. And B, yeah. I never, ever thought my book would get turned into a, a comic. The dream is that we'll do every chapter of the novel as a comic and then collect them together as a graphic novel uh, to rival kind of Watchmen or whatever and sell it to a publisher for, you know, 100k plus long term goal. Well, I, I suspect people should go and check out the fucking Kickstarter then. Um, but it hits. Sure. Yeah. Let's, yeah. Let's <laughs> Uh, right. right, come on, we've yeah. got to find out. We've got to get people putting some of their Kickstarter money where their mouths are. <laughs> Classy <laughs> live, yeah, but it will be. And I'll tell you when it is, so, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> top notch, top notch. right, it's story time. Regular listeners know how it goes. There will be three stories told, and all of them have been written to the same shared prompt. This week, the prompt is Peacock. And Ben, you're up first. Aye, aye. Peacock. Here comes the turkey, Daddy! The little voice cut through Chad's appreciation of the noise his crowd was making. Chad, squawking and twerking for all he was worth, lowered his beak-covered face to be level with the boys. I'm the fucking peacock! Chad screamed. The boy recoiled, and his father guffawed and yelled his approval for the prancing peacock. Along with everyone else in the damn place, thought Chad. That made it close to 50,000 pairs of eyes following his every move. The dorks running around after the pigskin were a sideshow. One the peacock tolerated when they were winning. Chad, whilst throwing out some star jumps and wing flaps to amaze the crowd, watched the game through the hatched one-way visor hidden beneath the peacock's beak. It was fourth down of the opening play in the final quarter, and a snap gave the QB room to throw a merry. Number 80 downfield leapt high as the ball fizzed through the air to land in his gloves like a TD-seeking missile. Chad heard the band start up with their rolling drums, and the brass section take a big, collective breath. Touchdown! Barked the announcer over the loudspeakers as the band struck up a bombastic musical celebration. Chad knew their eyes would soon come back to him and started forwards towards the 50-yard line, picking up speed. He hit the front flip well, but felt the drag on his peacock body as he tucked to get around in time. Chad landed with a bounce and went straight into a triple cartwheel. The world became grass sky, grass sky, grass sky. The head rush, when he finally jumped up to wiggle his tail feathers, was made all the better by the pop from the crowd. That's how we fucking do in Pennsylvania! roared Chad, beating his chest, forgetting for a moment what was under there. He felt the weight of his vest pulling him down, unbalancing him. But there was no other way to ensure the game kept going, no matter what. That's what the peacock said. Sticks of dynamite, the colour of hot dogs, ringed Chad's chest beneath the peacock's skin all of it taped in place and slick with condensed sweat. He'd been wearing it for the last five games, just in case Coach Buck followed through on his threats to replace him. You got one season left in you. Maybe less than that. I'm saying, let's start training the new guy. You'll see what he's got out there come game time. He does the sharp bit at the moment for Florida. Kids got moves, and you'd still be involved. Buck's words had haunted Chad, and the peacock had come up with a plan. The ref's whistle brought play back to the conversion kick. Chad readied himself to continue the celebration, but the kicker scuffed it into the defence. The turnover happened fast, and the opposition burst through the attacking lineup. Chad watched with horror as his counterpart for their team lunged forwards to take his spot. The son of a bitch was wearing a shark costume. Touchdown! came the announcer's shout. The shark danced obscenely. His tail swiped across Chad's costume where the peacock's crotch was. Chad doubled over to roll with the bit. He felt the shark's oversized glove slap his peacock face as he was on his weight back up. Chad's head flopped about inside the suit, and he felt the peacock stir from the back of his mind. He shoved the shark boy hard. Easy, buddy! It's just a game! The youngster's voice sounded hurt. Just a game, thought the peacock. Just a game. He kicked the legs out from under the shark and dragged him by his fins over to the water cooler. The peacock slapped the lid off it and dunked the shark. Get back in the water, you showboating fuck! The crowd were up off their seats faster than the coaching bench or even the stewards. Peacock felt the shark kid begin to twitch before he felt hands on him. People were trying to pull him away. The peacock snarled and let go. Coach Buck was in his face immediately. You are done, Chad! Get the fuck off my field! I'm the fucking peacock! Show you out, pal! Now get lost, you're fired! 
I ain't leaving until the game's over. And unless you want a hole in the ground where this stadium used to be, the game goes on. You crazy son of a bitch, whispered Buck as the peacock unzipped his chest to reveal the vest. Call the play, Buck, and let's see what this kid can do, or this place goes boom. The peacock turned and hopped his way back to the boundary line. He was a lightning rod for their adulation. The pen supporters had gone ballistic. Shirts were off and beer fountained from thrown cups. The shark kid was up again, and Peacock saw Buck have a frenzied conversation with him before shoving him back out towards the game. The whistle blew, but it could only just be heard over the crowd's noise. Just the game, is it? shouted Peacock at the shark kid as the kickoff resumed. Peacock danced and celebrated on instinct, one eye on the shark kid and the other on the blue-jacketed police filtering through the crowd. The kid kept up, but barely. The peacock could see he wasn't mascot material. The police were keeping a low profile, but he could see them listening intently on their radios. The game was all tied up into the last possession. A fumble led to a turnover, and another throw from the Pennsylvanian QB. Number 80 caught it again and pounded down the boundary line past the peacock. He didn't even wait for the band this time. Instead, the peacock hit the splits and came up fluttering his tail feathers. Touchdown! The high-caliber round sang out of its barrel with a snap which reverberated around the acoustics of the stadium, cutting off the cheer. It took the peacock through the head between the eyes and splattered stuffing foam out of the back. Chad stumbled with the impact and fell. The silence afterwards hurt more than the death of his suit. Strong hands pulled him out of the costume as they cut the vest from him. What was this guy supposed to be anyway? One of the SWAT officers said to the other as he zip-tied Chad's wrists and ankles. Chad giggled and whispered the answer. I'm a peacock. Jeez. <laughs> I had a really good time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and initially I was going to... It took me a second for it to click that it was American football with all the <laughs> uh, abbreviations, but then, it, yeah, it all falls into place. And, yeah. Yeah, nice. Appreciate it. Um, so I was uh, I was somewhat uh, out of sorts this last month, and I, I wrote this whilst I have this cold, um, and it felt like a fever dream whilst I was writing it, so I'm glad it kind of landed at all, at least. Um, yeah, no spoilers, but you and I have both written these stories under the influence of illness. <laughs> it's going to be a fun episode. <laughs> oh, there yeah. Are, there are some lines in there, Ben. <laughs> but the one I wrote down twice was <laughs> the shark danced obscenely <laughs> <laughs> available in no other context <laughs> a wonderful sentence yeah it brings me so much happiness i strive for my art my friend there's a lot of joy that you know despite despite him being a mentally unbalanced dangerous lunatic uh being the main character it's it's hard not to get caught up in the moment of it all so you did well i think in in capturing oh. that yeah that's a that's a really cool bit of feedback, I think, because um, I th I it, I think you have to get that electricity into this particular story, otherwise it doesn't work. Yeah. The um, it's got massive uh, Green Man vibes. For <laughs> oh yeah. Always sunny fans out there. Yeah, yeah. You know, his, if... his obsession with the like mascot monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, definitely, That's... yeah. I mean, uh, Always Sunny is one of my favorite TV shows, so it's definitely gonna. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's you know, it's set in Pennsylvania. It's you know, yeah, it's got a lot of um, carryover. I think had I not had this cold, um, those voices may have sounded a bit more like uh, Dennis and uh, Frank as well. <laughs> oh man! Oh no, that's way that's way worse now. <laughs> <laughs> what well, that it's Dennis in the in the people? Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. Ah, oh, yeah. No, it was a lot of fun. I um, we we just came off the back of uh, Nana Remo, um, Matt, and oh, uh, so lot lots of uh, writing, lots of editing. So it was, it was actually really yeah. fun. Sorry, go on. Are you allowed to say what you wrote? Um, yeah, we we uh, we put it all out through the podcast. We actually did the last four episodes. We've done our um, chronicling what we went through. Nice. Uh, last year, we both um, uh, worked on. Uh, uh, novels uh, in the same way on the podcast as well yeah and then this uh, this year we were editing them and, and uh, 
going through that process as part of this, using sort of Nanarimo as the uh, the goading rod. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I think uh, some success was had, wasn't it? Like you you got you sort of completed your uh, draft and, and began editing. Yeah. Um, and I'm sort of was... approaching this sort of final draft sort of situation. That's moderate cool. success. Mm, ah, moderate so success, I would say. Yeah. I've never known how to say it. So Nano Remo, that sounds makes it sound something cool rather than just some <laughs> weird, weird thing that like a cult or something you've joined for the month. It, yeah, it looks. I always think it sounds like uh, if you phonetically wrote down the noises the mouse droids make in Star Wars. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think people do. Um, people do get very into it. Um, yes. Which we sort of we we did get to a point where we were sort of railing against it, like this idea of. Uh, I think once once you've learned that you can write a hundred thousand words, I don't think you ever need to do Nano Remo again, really, um, unless you are you've absolutely hit a brick wall and you just need to get words on the page, um, because well, beyond that, that it's actually yeah yeah beyond that, beyond that it's not is, yeah not particularly helpful yeah. The nano room has come up. I'm assuming because this was kind of like uh, like a palette cleanser. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I've been, I've been writing, um, you know, sort of like low fantasy, gritty, a bit of magic in it, that kind of Ooh. thing, um, which has been a lot of fun. It's definitely my wheelhouse. Uh, but to get, you know, because we write um, every other week, pretty much for this for this podcast, yeah. um, it. I, I can't keep putting that in, so I, I love to jump around between the genres and stuff. Yeah. Um, I don't typically do much, like, supposedly real-world stuff like this one, uh, unless it's sort of historically based. Um, so, yeah, I would say definitely it was a palate cleanser. Um, a lot of fun to write. I Even though I've got a cold, really enjoyed performing it as well, which yeah. is a bit of a rarity for me, because I, I'm sort of sometimes not um, not as, like, uh, excited to perform it as, uh, as Nico is, but... I mean, it was, it was definitely a piece that was very comfortable in itself. Yeah. yeah. Which is, yeah. like, it, it does help you. Because you absolutely, like, the way you were kind of flying through it, it it, it gave it that feel, like the uh, the American football feel, of things were impacting off each other and everything was high octane, high pace. It did actually, the speed of the delivery absolutely matched the setting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was really good. I'd agree. It has a kinetic kind of um, energy to it. That, yeah, like I said before, carries you along. Um, so whether you're a fan of, of Range Loons or American football or, and none of the above, you can still appreciate something in this story. <laughs> well, thanks very much, guys. But I think it's time we hear from our guest. Matt, have you... Uh... <laughs> um, you actually wrote yours some time ago, didn't you? I did. Yeah, I was ready to go a month ago. Um, and forgive me for yeah, not, yeah. not listening to your Nano Remo um, episode yet. I'm still a way back because I discovered you in the summer and I haven't made my way through all of your uh, <laughs> not yet, you know, but I'm getting there. Yeah, it's fine. Um, but uh, yeah, take it away, man. Let's hear your story. Okay. Peacock. You're in the very swanky corridors of the Advanced Culture Institute. It's an imposing building situated in the heart of Canterbury in Kent built in the grounds of the city's famous cathedral. Inside, lit from all angles by soft, angelic lighting, is the peacock. We'll get to her in a bit. In one of the many corridors within the Institute, there seems to be an altercation taking place between a distinguished-looking gentleman in a tux, a floating drone shaped like the head of a gargoyle. The drone is speaking, explaining about a new exhibit the gentleman's inquired about. Ah, sir, you have exquisite taste, if I may say. Certainly the Institute's pride and joy. Very possibly the most unique specimen in not just ours, but any connection. This exhibit is so rare because she's actually still alive. We keep her in a permanent sleep status. Of course, this sets her apart from the non-living specimens, which are, are freely available to be seen by gold standard members such as yourself. The peacock, however, is only accessible for platinum level associates. We have kept her from public view and needs to be enjoyed by the very select. You see, her deformity is so incredible and utterly unique that it has to be held in a custom-built tank so that her display does not collapse. Okay, I'm intrigued. So uh, I'm told she has a fan of blood capillaries bursting out of her back in a semicircle. I don't even know how that could be possible, but I simply must see it. 
how much more would I have to pay to become a platinum whatever um, associate? Well, sir, I'm afraid it's not simply a matter of financials. Ad tier is very, very selective. I see you currently have a special gold sponsor, and we really do value your support. But your current tier is only priced at 300000 per visit. The jump to platinum associate is, is really quite steep. Oh, I'm sure it is, but uh, just how steep are we talking? Oh, of course, there is the financial element, and I don't mean to be distasteful, but you did ask. So the, the price for such the experience at the platinum level jumps to a minimum of one million per view. Then on top of that, there's a special arrangement which you must agree to. This is in addition to the finance and not negotiable. Oh, OK, go on, I'm listening. Well, sir, we would require a living sacrifice of your choice. What? What? Like a goat or something? You're, you're joking, right? The drone moves forward so it's uncomfortably close to the man's face. It's giving off intensely unnerving vibes. And as it speaks, its eye monitors turn red. No. Now I assure you, we do not joke about this. What we would require is a human, brought to us alive, which we would use as spare parts for our tickets. Mm, out of interest, where did you think we acquired such lifelike human anatomies? Oh, come on. I know, um, I know they are very realistic, um, but you're telling me that murder is committed in order to provide art exhibition? This is preposterous. Mr Brinkleforth. We prefer the term sacrifice. And if you have a problem, you now have a very severe situation. The information that you have just become aware of is not for public consumption. In fact, I'm being told you've been flagged as a potential security risk. This is most unfortunate. I'm so sorry that your squeamishness seems to have got the better of you. In order to remedy the situation amicably, we're going to have to ask you to... Um, Provide some more collateral as a sign of good faith. Oh gosh, um, well, w what might that be then? Wiggleforth tries to take a step back but finds himself pinned against a corridor wall. Well, sir, one acceptable form of collateral is a legal instruction to your banker that in the case of any dispute between us, all of your savings will be forfeit and immediately donated to our cause. Gosh, crikey, um, I'd be placing a huge amount of trust in you. I mean, you could bankrupt me overnight. How do I know you wouldn't do that? Well, sir, look at it this way. We have a huge amount of trust in you, also, because of the knowledge you now have. Forth looks shaken, but he managed to continue. I, uh, gosh, um, yes, okay, let's please take this as my verbal authorization to upgrade to a platinum level associate forthwith. And um, can I take it that any additional collateral that my bank instruction uh, uh, allows will we'll sign instead of a sacrifice? The drone backs away a little. We'll discuss that in a moment. I'm having the paperwork drawn up for you right now. You won't mind. Just running a quick credit check. It's strictly a formality, I assure you. <clears throat> oh yes, uh, quite so, Brinkleforth says. His face has taken on a somewhat ashen complexion. He is shifting from side to side on his feet. It looks like he's seriously wondering what he's got himself into. Oh dear. Oh dear, dear, dear. I'm most terribly sorry, sir, but your credit check has come up a little on the short side, and this leaves me only one other option, which I think, given the circumstances, we'll have to move towards. Um, oh, what? Okay. Um, don't tell me I have to give you a kidney or something. No, sir. No, sir, sir. Your medical records show that your kidneys are far from helping the frost exhibit here, and um, please follow me through this entrance and prepare for a small test that will prove your worth. Brinkleforth reluctantly follows the grotesque drone into a gloomy room which is lit only from the doorway behind him. Think fast, sir. This is your chance to prove your worth and become a platinum sponsor. We ask that you react to the circumstances as you see them and remember that we are monitoring. Best of luck to you. What the fuck? Brinkleforth is aghast to see Brutal, blood-stained weaponry scattered around the room before him. But before he can get his fully full bearings, a heavily padded door opposite thuds open, in tandem with the one behind him shutting. He steps forward in the virtual complete darkness and catches his foot on something heavy and sharp. The lights go up fully, and he looks down to see a long, thin spike has impaled his foot, 
protruding from his ankle. The pain hits in a nauseating wave and he collapses. Ah, my foot is fucked, he screams. He looks up to see a woman advancing towards him in purpose and pauses to pick up a dagger from the floor. Realising that impossibly he might now be in mortal jeopardy, Eagleforth scrambles towards a spiked hammer he has spotted. Tracking his movements, the woman rushes him, dagger raised. But as she moves to strike, Winkleforth grabs the hammer and swings it full force into her face. The impact smashes through her forehead and she drops immediately into a heap of jumbled limbs, broken skull fragments and blood splatter. Winkleforth throws up, his bile mixing with the woman's ebbing life juices. Bravo, sir, booms the voice of the drone which has floated up behind him. Authorised to administer first aid to your foot and take you through to witness the peacock when you are ready. An attendant in a hood appears with a wheelchair and helps sprinkle forth into it. The drone sprays his wound with some sort of freezing spray that immediately seems to stem the pain. I just, I, I just, oh God, I just killed a woman. What, what the hell am I going to do? Sir, you have proven yourself worthy and we will allow you to witness our rarest exhibit. Winkleforth allows himself to be moved out into the corridor and then back down towards a heavy security door, which glides open as they approach. God, this better be worth it, he thinks. His attendant wheels him around the corner, and there, before him, is the peacock, in all her magnificent glory. Winkleforth falls forward out of the chair, onto his knees, and starts to weep. Chilling is the... Uh... Word that I wrote down and then underlined twice. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, it, it's an understatement. Yeah. You see, why when I explained the plot to my work team, they both said, um, "We worry about you, Matt." <laughs> <laughs> so, I think, uh, Was it that worried them? Because there are several points at which <laughs> I think a medical intervention could be warranted. <laughs> they, I mean, I mean, yeah, quite a few bits of this tale worried them, but just taking a peacock as a prompt and making it into a humid deformity never seen before was one of them i think yeah that was that was sort of the first moment of horror in the in the story wasn't it that uh, yeah. that realization that it was actually like a like an extremely upscale uh, carnival of freaks sort of thing indeed um, yeah it was great there was something one thing that happened like throughout it whenever you said whenever the story went somewhere awful it did so multiple times which was excellent i loved it um, there was a, there's always this moment of delay before the character fully understands what's happening to them. Yeah. And that is extremely realistic, I think, for most people when something bad happens to them. And this guy's day gets substantially worse repeatedly inside about five minutes. <laughs> uh, and it, it's, it's fantastic. I did, however, think that I did have like a um, little trill of like excitement over the gladiatorial arena section um because of all this bureaucratic red tape that he was sort of having to go through like credit checks and all this sort of stuff yeah, yeah. It, there was something actually quite freeing about just being able to like fuck someone up with a hammer in order to get through it yeah um and so i so that I, I appreciate it um but it meant that i did i sort of lost my uh like chilling horror vibe because i was like oh this i'm i'm actually really down for this yeah <laughs> um which, it, so it was a po- yeah it was a positive response it just wasn't so uh, yeah. I was going to say, I just told you government, uh, probably is the only way you'll get a mortgage soon is by Mortal Kombat. So, um. Oh, that's wicked. I've been LARPing for so long, I might actually get a mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> just thump uh, re-smog with a, with a latex hammer and see how far you I get. I mean, you haunted pencil. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it won't be them though. You'll fight another, you know, peer of yourself, not a peer of the realm. <laughs> Another poor person. <laughs> Probably Ben, to be fair. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I, you know, we get all Shakespearean with it, Ben. I'd throw some red fabric out of a pocket. So the wound, I, I have succumb. See you at home. I have succumb. <laughs> Go 50-50 on the mortgage. Yeah. <laughs> easy, easy mode, mate. Love it. Um, yeah, uh, so the, the, the whole bit with the collateral was uh, very uh, horrid. And chilling um, this idea of like uh, the the peacock being the only living display yeah. as well was was really good. Um, loads. There were, I, I wrote also wrote down ebbing life juices because I, I like that one a lot. That's, that was a great phrase. Yeah. The um, the credit check was one of my favourite bits in that story. 
because everyone has had to do one. If it's like yeah. taking out a new phone contract or whatever, and even if you know you're fine, yeah, that what if for some reason they say no? Happens every time. You know, like using your your debit card on payday, <laughs> and you're still like, oh my god, what if it gets declined? Yep. And then it like when it actually does happen, it's like. Oh, that that that's the worst feeling I got all the way through it. <laughs> so I was like, oh my god, the only thing this man had going for him was credit. Yep. And he's failed his credit so like what what do you do? How do you even come back from that? You have to fight to the death, obviously. <laughs> no, it was it was a very exciting story. I um I liked the um the voice that you gave the character as well. There was lots of sort of ums and ahs and well, I think um you don't see yeah, that often, sort of... do you, in a no, 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 not enough. But if you if you were when you read it out, I always read my stories out, kind of or get them. Here's a tip that my, one of my team gave me: get a computer to read it out for you, and it's robot voice. Because yeah. even though it's it doesn't do the expression, it does give. It's brilliant at picking up typos. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, the, uh, yeah. That interestingly, sense. on that, because at one point he said, "Oh gosh." He immediately became Hugh Grant in my head. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's, oh, that's, that's really strange. <laughs> so instead of uh, beating up gladiators, he was just beating up journalists that have broken into his home and put a wiretap on him. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. He was supposed to be posh. I'm glad you got that. You went there and not kind of, you know, uh, Danny Dyer or something. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Danny Dyer would have wanted a few more people to come at him in that gladiatorial. Yeah, come on then, you mugs. Yeah, <laughs> he'd be making a program about it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here with a mortgage applicant. I can, the tension's palpable. I don't understand Danny Dyer at all. I don't get him. Is it his Cockney accent? No, I can understand <laughs> the words he says. As a concept, I don't. I fundamentally fail to grasp him. Have you ever seen that uh, Danny Dyer's like world's hardest men or whatever? Yeah program so, that you made so that's all where i was going because i i have seen the title of it and i've been like yeah. what a ridiculous fucking thing to make it's not what, so, it's one of it's not even a porno go on you know <laughs> so he doesn't get fucked in the ass repeatedly well, 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 oh, he, man, yeah. he, um, yeah. it's nev of, never stops being hard yeah. <laughs> one of the funniest things i've ever seen on television is that show trying to take itself seriously they're a <laughs> um a celtic versus rangers game wow right and he stood outside and he's like, you know, the tension's palpable. There's nowhere more dangerous than it as Kel Celtic versus... He keeps calling him Celtic. No. Celtic versus Rangers game. And as he's talking about it, right, a guy walks past with... He's got like a cup of bovril and he's like, oh, hello, and waves into the camera. Just this cheerful old man. Well, he's... <laughs> Trying to talk about how like you could cut the tension with a machete or so is, is that like a little catchphrase from the show? Is he's like the tension's palpable every time, no matter what yeah, situation. Loads of it. Then, oh god, there's one where he's in a pub with these. Um, it's with it's like a traveler pub. You've seen this quite a lot. <laughs> right, the, okay. the, he, the guy keeps really... saying, "He's like, oh, I, I don't want to hit you. I don't, I don't want to hit you." And he's eventually he's like, "No, go on, go on. It's fine." The guy punches him once in the solar plexus and Dyer folds up like an ironing board. <laughs> and then it, it cuts to him and he's like, oh, yeah, I didn't realize, you know, that really hurt. I didn't realise he was going to hit me that hard. <laughs> so, you know, there's been loads of these like celebrity boxing matches and stuff happening over the last like year and a half. Yeah. It'd be fucking amazing if Danny Dyer fought Ross Kemp. Oh, yes. And like, it, it, it received that same level of hype. But you can see that in their eyes, both men are shitting themselves because <laughs> they're secretly like... Com Complete, like walkovers. Yeah, but I, I, I pay to see it though. To be fair. Yeah, for definite. Yeah, and they'd have to go through with it because the money would be enormous. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. I don't suppose, and this is a long shot. I don't suppose either of you do have details with Danny Dyer because I actually do want to get in touch with him. <laughs> well, I think as soon as he hears this, if he ever does hear it, he'll be knocking on our door pretty, pretty fucking quick. <laughs> Regular listener, we're going to be on episode one of World's Hardest Podcast. <laughs> Sexual tension, that is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this podcast, I love it. Oh, right, okay. Well, you really started us off down a path there, my sorry, friend. Man, sorry. <laughs> love it, love it. Um, right, time for a third story, Nico. Uh, before I read anything, gang, this is the strangest story I've ever presented on this podcast. 
And I say that with nothing but pride. I, I, I also, I doubt it. Like, I feel like you're going to have to really bring it. Because uh, you've done some weird shit, man. <laughs> this is the peacock. In all his years as a medical professional, Dr. Schubert Wang thought he had seen it all. In an act of nominative determinism so heinous, it put the great bridge disaster of the Splat family reunion to shame. He had become the world's leading sexographer. A man so well versed in the clitori and testicular, he could thesis you to the brink of orgasm and have you writing your own sordid conclusions. Yes, it would be fair to say he'd never seen a fold he couldn't diagnose. Never had the words core blimey escaped his lips at the sight of an errant member because Dr. Wang was the very best. It was in preparation for his next book that he had sent letters to local newspapers all over the United States of America. The title, as it currently stood, was Get Your Five Inches a Day, The Fruit and Veg of the Loins. It was likely his publisher would strip it down to something pithy, perhaps vegetables, before it was sent worldwide. Whereupon, booksellers would argue over what section such a manuscript could possibly survive in. It was a simple enough concept. Everyone's bits, he reckoned, looked a lot like different types of fruit and vegetables. And who would know better than Dr. Wang when it came to a matter such as this? Well, perhaps a greengrocer, but they often fell down in the knob science department. There were the obvious ones, of course. Banana, bit of a curve to it, definitely knob-shaped. Cucumber, well, if only we could all be so lucky. But the long boy of the vegetable world was an obvious comparison. The more unusual, however, became obvious as you delved deeper into the more... Pinacularly peculiar. We have all, even the un-MD'd, heard of cauliflower ears. It is possible to produce a similar effect with your member. Simply slam a door slightly too early, and before you know it, your mangled manhood will have bloomed like a stem of brassica. Those biologically blessed with such a shape, and on his long travels he'd discovered a few, he'd separated into a separate broccoli category. They tended to be a bit less firm, and marginally less knobbly. He'd seen near everything now. In Ohio, he'd witnessed a brace of twins who had perfectly pear-shaped penises, one with a bulging base, the other inverted. Mercifully, neither of them were sporting a stem, although he had seen some that could represent that on their own. In Tallahassee, he'd witnessed a member so wide and ridged, the temptation of hollowing it out and adding a candle had been near overwhelming. The pumpkin had looked painful, the way the meat seemed to be holding itself in, like a lady's skirts in the rain. All of it had gone into Wang's notes. This one was going to be his biggest seller. Definitely. A few had bought a treatise on titties, averting a calamity, though he suspected it was mostly for the pictures. The medical field had recognised it as an unparalleled exploration of the tit, even if they had been surprised it wasn't about little birds. The second volume, Orgasm, I'll have one, one lump or two, had absolutely flown off the shelf. They still weren't sure if it was the instructions given in Chapter 4 or the low, low price that had driven the sales. It had ended up in a lot of husband's stockings that Christmas, though. And the husbands had, after a, a little read, normally on the loo, ended up in their wife's stockings. To great success. That had bought the good doctor almost too much fame. The morning television shows... The dates with celebrities, it had all been pressure in its own way to write a new book. So, here he was, reading a letter from a man in Kissimmee, Florida, claiming to have a gland so remarkably similar to the humble pea, it had to be seen to be believed. The letter 
did not disclose whether or not it was green. But it couldn't just be very small and round, surely. Most, if not all men, weren't sending out letters about if they had prize-winningly small willies. Wang had decided he must go. It could finish the book, he reckoned. Then straight back on Lorraine Kelly's little sofa for a chat, and maybe he'd find out what those pop stars were up to now. A temporary office had been prepared, and the clock showed seconds until their agreed meeting time. As though mechanical, there was a knock, and Wang called them in. The man that entered was handsome, in a weather-worn kind of way. We'll skip the start of their conversation, as it is mostly release forms, awkward application of latex gloves, and jokes that landed like a concrete goose in a shallow pond. Eventually, though, the man, one Jackson Punnett, was laid on a table. We'd best see it, then the doctor said, in what he hoped was a comforting way. It was produced, and the good doctor felt his breath catch. It tapered right to the tip. Several bulges along the shaft, which was not unconsiderable. There was no aperture at its tip. Instead, the doctor noted, along its length ran a seam. It looked in every possible way, like a pod of peas. Goodness me, said the doctor. Yeah, said Mr. Punnett. May I? The doctor gestured broadly at the podness. Oh, well, have at it, Doc. Jackson lay back, closed his eyes, and in a ritual as old as doctors, wondered where to put his hands when one of them touches your private parts. Wang flipped the thing back and forth between his mitts. It looked like a pod of sodding peas. He pressed a finger against the seam, and, ever so slightly, it parted. The man hadn't reacted, so with a smart motion he ran his finger along the length of it and it opened wide, sat in it, huddled to each other, five perfectly round balans sat. The pod's strange little family of peas. The doctor could swear their synchronised urethrae had turned to look at him, as though he'd interrupted a high-stakes poker game. No words came to him as he looked upon them, they looked healthy enough. They weren't, in fact, green. Eventually, he decided on... Do they work? The man Jackson didn't miss a beat. Yeah, Doc. Never had a problem with functionality. You're in and ejaculate? Yes, sir. The doctor wondered furiously if the man could achieve both at once. How could you even run that test? A strange feeling was running through him as he held the grotesque mimicry of a legume. He remembered standing in his grandmother's kitchen and watching her depod peas when he was a boy. That satisfying grit noise as she ran her thumbnail up the inside of the pod before discarding the outer shell. He didn't know what overcame him, but he thrust his thumb in a mirror of her action. With a series of quiet pops, the bell ends separated from their cocoon. He felt one bounce off his knee. His gaze was fixed on the empty package he was now wielding. Panic was an understatement. Very carefully, he felt with his toes to kick any errant dicks out of sight. There wasn't any blood. That was weird on its own. Carefully, he placed the two open halves of the penile pouch together. It felt like drawing the curtains on his career. The book was too real. Now, he didn't think he could tell this story on morning television. Or, in fact, anywhere that he didn't intend to be sectioned. He turned away from the prone man to try and dream up an excuse, an explanation, anything. And there... By his bag was one of the little loose penises. 
it sprouted from it tiny little tentacles and was moving like an octopus on land. His eyes followed it as it regrouped with another little critter. They moved as a pair. Yes, there was another. The man behind him was chatting away, and the doctor watched, transfixed. Slowly, the five little peas, devoid of pod, gathered by his bag. It tipped as they tugged at it. He watched his part-written thesis slide free, and one of the little things grip a pen in its prehensile meat tube. The doctor leaned close as they wrote. He saw they were adding to one of his earliest sentences. That all varieties of fruit and vegetables can be seen represented across the spectrum of genitalia, except peas. They underlined it. He felt those urethra turn to look at him again. He nodded, silently. They crawled away. Soft, sticky sounds, the song of their journey. The patient left, after some time. He'd been staring at the word, Except peas, for hours. He was going to change his name. He'd really rather gone off, Wangs. So, so exactly how much commerce and <laughs> have you smoked before you wrote that? I've been, yeah. <laughs> Listen, I've been very ill. <laughs> Holy shit! I mean, that is a, a tale of a very ill person. <laughs> <laughs> However, it somehow hung together. Uh, uh, nice. That very uh fucking i mean it did it did flow like it did hang it did yeah um and it was just filled filled with your like very you know you're with what we're accustomed to your sort of like visceral language that you use for it to apply to everything yeah that is the most knob gags that you've ever put in one story i have to say and that is an impressive thing so i applaud you for it also i mean not just knob gags because you had the the memory Wordplay as well. Oh, the, 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 yeah, the calamities. Yeah. <laughs> that is a thing of beauty. Um, I think it, I've encountered a few of those in my time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just I don't know quite what to say. Literally, I don't think anyone would after <laughs> after hearing that story. It was out there. Yours is on another level. <laughs> <laughs> I, I look, I don't know, all I'm going to say is this started. I mean, like. Imagining the guy using his thumb to pop them out, and I was like, "How do I get there? How do you get there? <laughs> I yeah, don't the, know." The uh, the root of that nominative de determinism was was fantastic. Like just going with that Doctor Wang thing. Yep. And then yeah, yeah it, the, it, I would say that like um, uh, the start is like a traditional one of your stories, uh, yes. and then it and then it and then it keeps jumping the shark. And I think if it happened once. We'd be like, ah, oh, I think you might need to rework that, Nico. But because it keeps happening, it, it actually becomes the new story structure. Is exactly how far does this fucking rabbit hole go? Yeah, it's like he was stroking uh, it, and yeah. and it was getting harder and harder, and you couldn't stop. <laughs> and then it sort of leapt out and crawled away. That's right, so like, I've googled thing, it. Guys. I, it reminds me of the thing with the, you know, the, I thought they might we might go into some body horror as opposed to just body bizarreness. Uh, when they gang together, I thought they were going to attack him, and and you know, I did consider that. Warm as hide is like, a it's... man's cock, you know. What I mean, it's too much for five little knobs to beat a man to death. <laughs> is that? I mean, is that did... my line? They did damage his uh, magnum opus, which is worse in a way. Yeah. So yeah, as I was saying, I I have googled it. An obsession with the penis, Nico, is called mentilomania. Mentilomania. So um. I probably should have looked that up before now, really. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I think we can safely, yeah, I can think we can safely apply that label to you now. <laughs> I realised that I, I wrote a whole story about penises that look like plants and didn't use the word seed. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah I, kept, oh. I, I kept because he keeps putting seed in stories just to make me chuckle. Really? Um, so yeah, so um, no, but you did make me chuckle a whole bunch of times. It the, it wasn't uh, not gag, but the splat disaster at the start was quite that. 
that's, that's one what... of my favorite jokes in it. Yeah, that that really got me going. Um, Pinacularly peculiar <laughs> was was another one. Um, I enjoyed the uh, the cucumber being the long boy. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, that was that was a lot of fun. Thanks, like made me laugh a lot. Yeah, I guess sorry, society. <laughs> yeah, yeah, one I've ask, done. like, how much research you did for this? <laughs> I, I looked down <laughs> and in the fridge. Oof. Oh, I did have to look at. No, I did have to look up uh, another way of saying cauliflower. So brassica. Yeah. That came yeah. from research. <laughs> oh no! It's this this poured out of my my very cold adult brain. So, uh, <laughs> but, I mean, hey, I mean, if you ever need a job at Viz magazine, I think they're crying out for Peacock to be an actual character in it. God, I would, I would love to work at Viz. Yeah. You, you actually are a big fan of Viz, don't you? I am, yeah. Absolutely, I don't say that as a diss. I say that as a badge of honour. <laughs> yeah, well, let's see if they'll buy the five perfectly formed Bellens playing poker, and we'll go, we'll go from there. <laughs> Well. Oh, buddy, that's work, man. <laughs> uh, right. Okay. So um, we can uh, we can definitely point people towards uh, your uh, website, Matt. Thank you. Um, CompleteDarknessNovel dot com. Yeah, that's the best I've got at the that's moment. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's yeah, slightly yeah. short term because but, as soon as I have another book out, it'll be like, oh god, um, I need to have another one. Fantastic. Also, I mean, I I was so excited about having a book out. That I got the ISBN number tattooed under my bicep. I read it, but you know, the more yes. books I write, I, I could end up with a whole sleeve of, you know. Um, but it's handy. Someone says now, I was at an exhibition and this lovely woman came up to me and said, Oh, how do I find your book? I just did a gun pose and I'm like, check this out, put this in Amazon and you'll find it. <laughs> <laughs> Cheesiest thing ever, but it made me happy. So smart. I like it. I like it. And uh, you can also follow him on Twitter at uh, Cleric20. Yeah, people have asked, for years have asked me why Cleric 20, and now they've read my book and realised he's my main character and thought, oh, okay, fucking clever, nice, playing a long game there. The so longest he, con. So he's been stewing in your head for a while, oh, he? Many, many years, yeah. I mean, he's sort of my mm -hmm. alter ego. Um, you know, he's, he's the cool, uh, if you're in the Matrix, you know, he's, he's that version of yourself that you want to see on the screen. Um, yeah, why not? Well, you'll have to uh, join us next time for when we're going to uh, ask Matt some questions and learn a bit more about his book and stuff. Uh, looking forward to it. I love your outro. That's strong. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Yeah, we had we had natural musician do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Tiny Bookcase. Remember to subscribe, otherwise you're going to miss out on the future fun. Also, tell a friend. If you like this episode, link them to it. We'd be tremendously grateful. You can follow us on Twitter at Bookcase Tiny, Facebook at The Tiny Bookcase, and Instagram at Bookcase Tiny for updates. Speaking of supporting the podcast, well, magic can only take one so far. The Tiny Bookcase is supported by the generosity of its patrons. Those kind souls have really kept my belly full the last year. Let's cast a spell for them, shall we? For uh, Magnificent Beardery, let's cast the Chinicus Folliculale spell on Gary Laird. For Rich Ginger Tones on the scalp, let us cast the Orangi Hedondo spell for Scott Byrne. And for General Fabulousness, why not the Ulala la la Alge Your Mother spell on Matthew McLaren? <laughs>